fun. <laughs> Alrighty, so um, here is a little bit of an update of what um, I've been up to since I last got to chat with all of you. So um, I have shifted from being a PhD student to now an employee. I'm a community manager at the Alan Turing Institute um, since I started my fellowship. Um, and what I kind of want to explain needs a few different steps as we're all familiar with when we're building research projects. So I'll first kind of give you a bit of background to the project, what it is, what it does, what its kind of goals are. I'll explain a little bit about what I do within that and then draw a few links to um, some fellows that I've connected with through the SSI and that has helped this project be what it is. So the project is called um, AIM or AR Artificial Intelligence for Multiple Long-Term Conditions. It's a research kind of program funded by the NIHR that focuses on the use of data science and artificial intelligent tools um, when it comes to healthcare, health data records and um, social science so that new clusters of disease patterns um, can be identified um, as multiple long-term conditions develop over the life course. Um, and there is this focus on multiple long-term conditions um, although this definition varies between different research groups, it's generally said that um, if you have two or more, uh, potentially three or more conditions and at least five or more medications. So that's the research project, but what is this actually made up of? Um, so I use a Terry Pratchett quote about turtles all the way down. Don't really, you don't need to read my screen. Um, if you can kind of, it's more of a reference as I'm talking. So there are seven different consortia that are then have their own kind of research questions um, that are then themselves made up of research consortia. So it really is consortia all the way down when it comes to the AIM project. There are a lot of collaborators spread all across the UK. But the research support facility is kind of separate to this. And the research support facility is meant to act as a hub in a hub and spoke model. It is collaboration and a partnership between Swansea University, the University of Edinburgh and the Alling and Turing Institute. And the goal of the research support facility is to build tools and to support the collaboration between, across um, and within all of those different research consortia that then are made up of consortia. So you can start to see where some problems may arise. There are four um, kind of core themes and then a fifth theme that cuts across these different projects that the research support facility, the RSF, supports. The first one is about reproducible and secure infrastructure, so your um, trustworthy research environments. The core one that we're using on the AIM project is SAIL. We have an awesome team of data wranglers, which I think is the coolest job title ever. Um, as we are working with um, health data, there's a lot of structured missingness. Um, there are records over the health records over the span of 20 years. And so the goal of the data wranglers is really to help curate the data and help researchers um, combine data sets and do that initial exploratory data analysis to support the research kind of going ahead. The, um, this theme is about uh, community building and training kind of across the AIM consortia. Is that what training um, do different researchers need as people are coming to this from a varied background um, and trying to kind of galvanize the community? Theme four is about PPIE, um, so which is a weird acronym in my accent, but what it stands for is Public and Patient Involvement Engagement, or at its heart, citizen science, ensuring that citizens, members of the public, patients are actually embedded and involved in the research um, that the um, researchers by career are conducting. Um, and it really is a co-designed process. And then again, this final theme, theme five, cross cuts all the others because it is about sustainability and legacy. So what we have to think about is if we are doing a lot of work curating data, we can, um, packages um, be built so that you don't have to continually um, run the same thing. So we can a uh, um, Python package be built to help things along. Where can documentation help? Where can we build things into the way that we work that outlive just our project and then also can be useful to other projects? Um, and this theme is kind of like, again, 
uh, drawing strongly on, on the manifesto of the Southwest Sustainability Institute, but also we're thinking about this throughout all the different work packages, um, theme one, two, three, and four, where can we actually do work that is sustainable and will create a legacy that other projects can learn from? So that's the project itself, but where do I kind of fit into this? I'm a community manager, and as mentioned, we have a massive community that's made up of staff um, working at the research support facility. So this is our internal team and folks we collaborate with. Then we have the consortium themselves and all of the personnel that work on a specific research project. We have PPIE groups, that's again public groups, members of the um, patients and members of the public, whether they be our charities, third sector organisations or independent organisations. Um, we're working with several NHS trusts. There's obviously, aside from the groups, there are people built with these multiple long-term conditions that are not formally organised yet, but we want to be bringing into research and supporting. And then there are external researchers and clinicians who have never heard of AIM until we talk to them. And this is what we consider a massive uh, AIM RSF or the AIM community. There are several challenges with this other than the sheer size and scale of it as it's spread out around the UK. As, we, as many of us know, a lot of academic research tends to happen in silos um, and many of the researchers um, and the research groups who are working on this AIM project haven't worked together before. They don't have a developed practice of collaboration with external groups. And so therefore there is this research that's happening in silos. Again, kind of building off that, there are often competing interests when um, there are research groups trying to vie for the same journal and this idea of public, um, publish or perish within research and um, how that actually works when we are trying to um, show and collaborate in the process. So if there is a piece of analysis that one group has developed that might be useful for another, there is not necessarily a um, common practice of sharing things as they are being worked on. There is also, I've lost my screen, my mouse a little bit there. Um, the knowledge transfer between different groups. So community members of diverse backgrounds, whether that come from a healthcare setting or whether that come from a computer science background, they do not necessarily have really strong systems to be able to understand what um, the background and knowledge base of one another are within groups, but then across the groups, and then be able to develop into a way that can upskill everybody. The funding structure that the AIH has um, developed that involves members of the public and this co-design is also kind of a newer um, piece um, around the NIHR wants to see this collaboration, this data sharing, these um, results in the process and also public involvement. However, how we do that and how we facilitate that hasn't necessarily been set up. So it's a lot of challenges, but Last time I chatted to the community call, I got some kind of inspiration and ideas and the core pieces of this were how to create a shared journey um, so that everyone in the AIM project from day one, we're all standing on day one, no matter what your background is. So there is this shared identity, this shared community as we are learning about this AIM project. It was also highlighted that having a central base for information, um, whether it be about events or resources, would be really important so that people could also find meeting notes. And a final part around fostering relationships. So I believe there was a quote about looking for the people who want to work with you. Um, and since then, it's been a really fantastic time working on the AIM program. So how did I actually um, kind of operationalize this and how am I going to tackle this? Is this is a kind of the, I know the fellowship is once a fellow, always a fellow. And so I'm trying to take this approach with the program as well. It's another two years of this. Um, so it's been really cool, but how, how are we trying to galvanize this community? So if my first approach is to upskill the researchers themselves um, so that the work itself may be reproducible so that, um, we don't necessarily have to um, start from square one when we're explaining about building sustainable software. We don't necessarily have to explain the importance of PPIE. We're all on the same board so that we can do it. This also means that the um, knowledge base that we have as we're learning needs to be accessible by all members at, um, within AIM at any point in time so that the documentation is captured but also transparent so that there is this continual learning and the shared learning. And the final piece is really around community unity. 
um, as I like to say it, is that how do we foster a community that really champions open research practices, but also collaborative research practices at its heart. So let's break it down even further from those kind of three high level pieces. So the first approach and the first step was to collate and curate resources in a central hub that community members can join, can look at, can learn from and contrib can contribute to. The second piece was around workshops. So Irene Zompa, um, who is my fellow community manager on AIM, um, is an absolute rock star um, at R, and she is doing a lot of work um, upskilling many of the AIM researchers on R, and it's fantastic. Um, we then thought to learn to learn from the Turing Way model with a collaboration cafe, so hosting slightly longer sessions where they are slightly less structured and people can drop into them, because these sessions will then lay the foundations for knowledge exchanges to happen across the projects as there is a rapport building, and we can start to understand where the projects are. That will then lead into this idea of open collaboration so that these projects can not just share resources but also share learnings and hopefully um, contribute and collaborate contribute to collaborative projects themselves, not just ones in their individual consortia. Um, and hopefully what we're aiming for is in Q2 or potentially the start of Q3 in 2023. We want to follow the reproducibility hack or repro hack format. If you're not familiar with it, you try and reproduce someone else's work. Um, and except instead of reproducibility, because many of us are working, many of the AIM consortia are working with health data, we want to do a replication hack. Many of the consortia are working with slightly different data sets. And so um, what we're actually aiming for is to teach the reproducibility skill sets, teach the computational skill sets that are needed to, in order to replicate one another's work, and then try it out so that a consortia member from Daenerics will then try and replicate um, the results from AIM mixed and so on and so forth for the different consortia. So this was kind of how we started approaching it. So where are we now? We've created a GitHub organization and we have um, currently 10 different repositories sitting in it. Some of them are public, some of them are private, but we are starting to um, launch this through GitHub, through teaching these computational skills, these repositories that host our training, that host glossary of terms and can host resources. We also have a trialing out a website, um, which will be a, a user friendly um, version of the GitHub repositories where we can um, share information about the events that we are running, as well as any of the resources that are being developed. Um, one of these resources is the glossary of terms. Is that something that came up quite a lot? Is that research lingo isn't always the most accessible? And so potentially having a glossary that could be used and searched within meetings, but also contributed to and built by the community. And I would like to thank Sarah Gibson, um, who I believe is on this call and a fellow SSI fellow um, for uh, the awesome documentation tutorial she's written on um, using Jupyter Books and CICD um, for, for this. I couldn't have done it without uh, her help. With the workshops, um, I've talked a lot about GitHub um, and so there is a friendly introduction to GitHub workshop that um, a lot of the communities that I've interacted with use, such as Open Life Science um, and Mozilla. Um, and I wanted to take a step back. <laughs> Thank you, Yo. Um, wanted to uh, take a step back and understand why are we actually running and having the exercises in these workshops that I have. So I have built on them, reformed them a little bit so that the goal isn't just, you know, how to set up a repository. It's not just, you know, how to open issues and you know how to navigate GitHub, whether that be through the browser or through the command line. But what we actually have is I pick for each workshop a different open source project, um, whether that be the Turing Way or sometimes sneakily the glossary of terms, if it needs to be updated by the AIM community. And I try and use, create some issues that are curated and actually use those in the workshop. So that at the end of the workshop, um, the participants have contributed to a project and have gone through the process of making a pull request to a large existing um, project that has a lot of infrastructure. So it's not quite as daunting when you first step onto it. 
it's been really, really cool to see the kind of commits come through as we've been running these workshops throughout the year. So um, as of, I think, November 1st, 2022, I've run 16 workshops, um, kind of introduction to GitHub to land on that final format that I just spoke about. And the final kind of big workshop that I'd like to highlight to the SSI is um, co-facilitated with Meg Doherty, who was also in my cohort this year, and it focused on um, public and patient involvement and engagement. Um, the idea is that because this is a new format, because not many researchers um, have the depth of um, experience with involving members of the public in research throughout the full process, not as subjects or participants, but as fellow scientists. Um, Meg held not just a panel, but also a seminar series um, with the AIM community showing about how she has done it with her communities and with her group in the US. Um, and it landed really well. So thank you, Meg. So where we are kind of now is that we're starting to um, build these collaboration cafes out. We are on our fourth um, month of this. And so where we, trying to, where we are right now is trying to lay these foundational pieces for this knowledge sharing as we move into the next year. The hope is that next year, these researchers will then be kind of empowered, members of our community will be empowered um, to share the knowledge, they have the skills through these trainings and the confidence to be able to continue this virtuous cycle um, of research that if we train um, one co-I or a postdoc that they will then um, go back to their research lab and um, continue on the training. The idea is to train the trainers continuously throughout the AIM program so that when we come to um, mid to early uh, next year that we can have this AIM RSF branded repo hack or replication hack um, on synthetic data within a sandbox trustworthy research environment so that the AIM researchers can um, check the computational reproducibility and replicability of their own research and of others research to provide feedback and improve what they are doing. So to kind of go back to those challenges that I highlighted as all of this, what I've just explained is still very aspirational. Um, within kind of the aim, what we started, we were facing huge research silos, these ideas of competing interests within academia that uh, have a long, a long history. We were struggling with the ability to transfer knowledge between senior researchers and early career researchers and community members of different backgrounds. And there wasn't necessarily, there was, wasn't necessarily buy-in and there was a bit of skepticism about this new format of doing things. But where we are now is, and when we go along this plan, is hopefully having built a community that really engages in collaborative research so that AIM researchers and these AIM projects can work together on areas of overlap and they adopt this kind of collaborative way of working, whether that be through documentation or sharing or the use of GitHub repositories. They are then sharing kind of resources, whether those be knowledge, whether that be collaborating and using a specific high performance computing center, whether they're sharing data, um, data analyses or subsets of data that they have um, cleaned, whether it be packages, whether it be PPIE resources, the idea is ultimately to share resources so that the outputs are greater than the sum of its parts. We're also really hoping to again capture that knowledge, that expertise um, that has been generated throughout the learning process of working on AIM and the integration of kind of what I call best practices. I know it's cliched, but the idea is that what we've learned, the outputs um, are captured through documentation um, and the computational work so that what they're doing can be reproduced or replicated and that members of the public are integrated into the research process itself. Thank you for listening. There was a lot of information. I um, would love to hear what questions you all have.